Hello, 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 everyone. Oh, that doesn't look good. I don't look good there. Well, let me try this. I'm, oh boy, not that I care how I look for the, let me try this one. There we go. Ah, backup system. Bob should be on in a minute. Boy, that looked a little ghostly from the other one. Wow. Maybe the mook the market spooked me or something. Or Netflix earnings. Or Netflix earnings might have had something to do with that. With that, hope everyone survived a again long volatility. Be long volatility. So let's just get to the bob so I can keep working on some stuff in the background, trying to fine-tune. The backup system, computer system. If you are new here, give us a chance and subscribe. And don't lose your pants. There we go. I made a rhyme. There, that's all we need. Let's see. Bob, you look so serious in the background. Let's see if the Bob button works. Oh, I had to finagle with it, and this is on the backup system, but I wanted to make sure the setup still worked because when you were at the gym the other day for your Surprise guest appearance from the gym. You know, I was messing with settings and then I tried to transfer it to the backup system and it works. Good. It's good to see that work, Mikey. Yeah, Netflix earnings pretty strong. Are they faked? <laughs> it might be. You know, it's interesting because like the market doesn't seem to be reacting to the subscriber growth beat, right? But Netflix is not breaking that down anymore, which I think is interesting. And it seems like they might be kind of trying to get people to to focus on them more like another company where it's not necessarily about how many people you got signed up, but about like the net, this new advertising model that they're going to. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with that because it could cannibalize some of their regular subscribers. Uh, I'm not sure because I didn't really read up how it's going to work. Is it going to be one major block of ads in the middle of a show or is it going to be all the way through the shows? I'm positive you won't be able to fast forward through the ads. Um, but initially, at least what I heard is like the charges for these ads are going to be astronomical to the advertisers. So it could really, really bump up their earnings and it looks like Netflix is finally breaking out of this this channel they've been running in. It so should tar it should hit the two hundred on the daily. So reset with the two hundred on the daily. By the way, earnings per share three ten versus two thirteen expected. Revenues of seven ninety three billion versus seven eighty three billion, and uh, two point four one million subscribers versus one point oh nine million subscribers expected. So, and then, yeah, as you said, they are not. Growth, what was that? Subscriber growth number may not continue to matter the way that it used to um, with this new advertising model. Because, like, I mean, imagine theoretically if they got, um, you know, they didn't have a huge subscriber growth, but they got a def, uh, like a massive revenue bump from advertisers, right? I mean, it probably be some people interested in the stock. And, we have not been able to even make any sort of attempted move to fill that gap from April. And it looks like, I mean, at least post-market might be trying to do that. Post-market, we'll yeah. Post-market. We'll see. We'll see tomorrow, as the uh, Zen master said. The, I'm, I'm watching. I mean, it was up, but the... The AI, this, this 200 is going to be a magnet at 283 over the next couple days. Yeah, and I mean, the pre-market's almost there. or I'm sorry, post-market's almost there already. Yeah, um, post-market. Post we had the the 50% key retracement and the harmonic are right around this 274 area where it's trading right now. So the high in post-market's 278.94, at least according to my E-Trade system. I assume that's going to be close to accurate. Post-market's yeah. always Oh, why did that disappear? Oh, jeez. Oh, my things disappeared. Sorry. My numbers were off. The 279.61 is the 50. Is yeah. the 50% retracement. It moved, so I have to correct that. Uh, so this is my magnet area for tomorrow and the partial gap fill. There'll be a, a fantastic uh, play to the downside again. Yeah. For this one. But... 
That's where we sit. We had a lot going on today, Bob. I want you. Did we know? What was that? I said, did we know? We always did. You know, you can't take a nap during these markets. <laughs> <laughs> it's not nappy nap time. Oh, my God. Would you stop with that baby talk? You're driving me nuts. <laughs> what? Christ. Nappy nap, speaky speaks, you're rhyming, you're killing me over there, Mikey. Well, that see, that's why you tune in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to the serious stuff. Uh, anything in the data you saw today besides the uh, housing market index absolutely crushed? Yeah, the housing market index was ugly. Yeah, I was looking at a lot of, I, I started looking at a lot of housing numbers, and housing looks really, really bad going forward. Um, we had one of the biggest jumps in new home prices in history post-pandemic, like just that little post-pandemic period where some economies were opening and others were not. Uh, so I guess it technically wasn't post-pandemic. So obviously you're going to see some pullback from that. But these numbers are really ugly. I don't remember an NAHB lower than 38. Uh, I'm gonna look as we're talking, but could, that could might you look, be sorry. a new low. Could you look it up from the depths of the last housing sort of depression? We'll call it. <laughs> yeah, I can. Um, let me just get to where I have that. Um, it's one of the things I keep track of because the new home builders. So the new home builders price index leads to a lot of things, right? Um, it's more of a commodity gauge than existing home sales are. Um, if the NAHB housing market index is going up, you could, there's no direct correlation to commodities, but you can kind of take a look and see if commodities are rallying as well. So the last time we were this low was, wow, I can't read that. Um, last time it was this low, we reached 30 May 5th. 14th of 2020 so that's pandemic depths right 37 on may so even today today's number would have been the third lowest including the pandemic well, let's go to the maximums here depths of the housing crisis the worst mike was nine okay that was in uh january 15th of 2009 or 2000, no, yeah, 2009. So in 2009, it reached nine. But I mean, you're talking about with these numbers that we saw today, if you exclude the two pandemic months, we have not been this low. There was a 37 print in 2012, August of 2012, there was a 37 print. So excluding those two pandemic months. And I actually find it really um, interesting that you only have to exclude two pandemic months, right? <laughs> I mean, the, we, the pandemic was more than two months. Was it? So, yeah, it was. <laughs> um, I Shashi, I don't agree that the market is shrugging off all bad news. I, I've gone on record as saying I think the fourth quarter is going to be positive. I've said that. But we had a mix of good news and bad news today. Uh, the the industrial production figures were were higher. Capacity utilization in the U.S. was higher. The ZEW index for the EU, while still negative, was better than expected. We didn't have all bad news. We also had yields come off a little bit. So we didn't have all bad news today at all. So I, I would disagree. Now, Coco is asking if I'm bullish now. Am I the only one in the room when I said that the fourth quarter would be positive? Am I the only one that heard me say that? Isn't this like the third or fourth show that I've said that on, Mike? It is. I mean, people crack me up. Are you bullish now? No, I'm not bullish or bearish ever, Coco. You freaking knucklehead. I mean, tell me, literally, you've been in almost every show where I've said that I'm never bullish or bearish. I just take positions based on price. And also I said, I thought that the fourth quarter would be positive, although 2022 will not go positive anymore. 
Uh, there's there's very little chance 2022 will turn positive. We're not going to recover 20% in the fourth quarter or 25%, whatever the year is down now. Not happening. I thought we were going to all-time highs. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, I swear to God, Gary the golfer's in here. I like that. Um, I swear to God, people just pay attention to what they want to pay attention to. That is true. Yes, I'm yelling at you guys. I'm crabby today. Uh, George, you're doomed. <laughs> Bob was your entry. Do not trade Bob. Okay, no, Bob is not a system. I not, I, I'll tell you something really funny. We had a service years ago. Mike, I don't know. I think you were a part of this one. I don't remember. Years and years and years ago, where the first three trades that we sent out were losers. And I got an email from a woman who said, I had a $10,000 account. And I put 30, 33% in each one of your trades and I lost all my money. You're terrible. And I said, who the fuck ever told you to do that? Who the hell told you that in the first trade, you should be 30% exposed? By the way, our next nine were winners. Next nine trades in a row were winners. Anyway, thank you, Sterling. I appreciate that. Uh, Sterling said I've been very consistent. You've been consistent. And I have. I will reiterate, just like what, you, A, you shouldn't just blindly take trades off of anybody on the YouTube, just saying, because I put on a position. That's period. Yeah. It's, you know, then I'll start getting into audited versus unaudited positions and everything else. However, you know what? Don't just tune into a channel and say, oh, this person's bullish. I should go long or this person's bearish. I should go short. You have to have a methodology. You have to know your reward to risk. <laughs> you have to know a bunch of things you don't just put on. You know, I don't put on a position because Bob's long or, or putting on a long or short. I have to have my triggers and my my methodology, which we can agree on trades. Bob has stuff that he puts on that I go and that's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he probably is, he probably looks at some of my stuff and goes, that's interesting. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, let's see. The screens are too hard to read. S&P target. I'll give you an S&P target. How's that? S&P 6,000 by the end of the year. <laughs> that's so he, I could tell just by the way, uh, I'm, how, do, how are we saying that? Mitan Shu? I don't know. Well, however he say, you could tell that that's more tongue in cheek. Like he's good. It's a rah-rah and not like a troll. Um, S&P target. We're, Puddin needs one. Hold on a second. I'm going to give him mine yeah. for the end of the quarter. Puddin needs an S&P target. <laughs> no problem. My S&P target for the end of the quarter. 4,048. There you go. 4,048. Yeah. That's approximate. I'm trying to... Where, where did you pull that one from? The potential double bottom on the daily. The potential double bottom that I don't think is a double bottom? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Is it outside of the range on the bottom? I haven't met that. Yeah. It looks like that right hand low, but I'm going to go ahead and make that a target. It's not, it's not a proper double bottom. But well, I can totally see that it, being. Here point. you go. Just say it's the 200 uh, simple on the daily coming in at uh, 41. It's 41, 48, 41, 50 area. There you go. I've got a significant level at 41, 50 as well. I have a significant level at 41, 37. There you go. So yours There's is your wrong. Time, Sorry, yours is wrong. There's your target. <laughs> I'm fine with that. There's your target, Puddin. There's there's the targets. That, don't quote me on that. I have uh, slightly different targets. Uh, Sasha is 4,200 by the end of the year. The uh, double was is only valid on the NASDAQ, Coco. George is taking it to the bank. Uh, Mitanshu, thank you. I asked that the other day. Mitanshu. Mitanshu. Thank you for that, Mitanshu. I appreciate it. The, Again, I, I think his comment was not trolling. It was more tongue-in-cheek, more of a rah-rah comment. Disclaimers are too hard to read, Bob. Mitanshu, can I tell a quick disclaimer thing, Mike? Sure. So, 
I disclaimers drive me crazy for a number of reasons. Number one, we're one of the only industries that needs to put disclaimers. So for example, if a roofer comes and your neighbor says, Hey, I got this really good roofer. Well, how do you know he's a good roofer? Well, he did my roof and it was good. And then he did my neighbor's roof and it was good. And he did my brother-in-law's roof and it was good. Okay, cool. Now this roofer comes over, his wife left him the day before he starts your roof. He got drunk. He screws up your roof. Past performance is not indicative of future results with roofers either. You go into a restaurant, they got great food. All of a sudden, for some reason, you have a shitty meal at that restaurant. Maybe the main chef is gone. Maybe they got some bad fish they didn't notice because they were in a rush. Past performance for a chef is not indicative of future results in his cooking. But it's a pretty good indication of future results. But our industry is the only one that has to put a disclaimer. And here's why. What past performance does not guarantee future results means is if Mike gives you nine good plays in a row, that does not mean his 10th one is going to be effective. That's what it means. So if you go, wow, this guy just, you know, nine times in a row, he's pretty much dead on. I'm putting all my money into the 10th one. That's your fault. It's not Mike's. That's what those disclaimers mean. You really don't have to read them, Mitanshu. You don't. You just know that as everything in life, just because the last one was good, let me the next one's good. There you go. Yep. That's what a disclaimer is. And really, everyone should have to put up a disclaimer. Not just financial guys, but we're the only ones who have to. And even in... Look, I mean, even back to your first thing with the the uh, back to that signal stuff. It's why I really hate signals, too, because people don't manage risk management. Let's say you have a 70 percent probability. Could you have eight losers in a row? Yeah. Does that invalidate the 70 percent probability? No, because, you know, out of 100 trades, anything can happen in the short term. Anything can. Yeah, and it's interesting because a lot of the times what happens is people return chase. And this happened when we had our hedge fund, not me and Mike, uh, me and a guy by the name of Ray Horn. We had our hedge fund. People would return chase. So we'd have three, four, five good months in a row. And people would be like, oh, they're on a, they're on a roll. I'm, I'm getting in. And then we'd have our drawdown. You know, and people would be like, what happened? Nothing happened. We, we tend to have drawdowns. Everybody does. And the same thing happens with signal services is, you know, someone will be like, these guys have been dead right. I've seen this with a with a specific uh, crypto guy who had years and years and years of very powerful returns to Trump it because crypto was doubling and tripling every year. Right. So <laughs> when that happened, people were like, oh, I'm getting in crypto. I'm getting in crypto. I know a guy who was actually involved in the actual product. He was also involved in our stuff. And he said, I'm getting out of stocks. I'm dumping everything in crypto. He said that at about the highs, at about the top. Now, I haven't talked to him in a long time, but I suspect he regrets doing that. I really do. That's where people look at stuff. They even look at the like the last one or two year performance and, the, and then they shift all their 401k to the what's been the hot stuff and then the hot stuff. Eh, <laughs> it's not so hot anymore. And if you listen to Mike and I, you will never, there will never be, if you listen to what Mike and I teach and say, you'll never be involved in a Bernie Madoff, ever. Because you won't buy it. You won't believe it. You will never give your money to Tom Tom. <laughs> but, but he makes over half a million dollars a year when he's not trolling YouTube yeah. channels. Uh, All right. Somebody asked me a question here. Well, hold on. Candidly, yeah. Bob, you were – hey, Options22. Candidly, Bob, you were the first to mention a positive Q4. It was eye-opening given the environment. Then Bill Ackman came out and said the same thing. Then Shem- – how do you say his name? Chamath Palyapatia. I cannot you say – who else did it? Mike Wilson from Morgan Stanley, who's been very dead right on a lot of things. He said it now, too. And I'm not saying they get it from me. 
it's just when you've seen so many of these cycles, you just start to realize that, okay, fourth quarters tend to be strong anyway, despite people thinking that October is historically a bad month. Historically, the worst month is September, not mm -hmm. October. So um, it, it just it just seemed to me that an exhausted market would probably slowly rally on low volume and earnings that are not as bad as people think. And I've said this since Mike has been asking me to come on here, that I really think Q1, Q2 next year is where we get the earnings debacle. Now, I, I'm ready to be corrected on that, and I'm also prepared to change my mind if something changes. But I really think that's when we, when earnings take the beating, is, is first quarter, second quarter next year. So I appreciate that options. And it is Chamath Palyapatiya, Mitanshu. I'm teaching you how to speak Indian in your India. Uh, no doubt, guys. Y'all do good work here. I'm usually just a passive viewer. I come for the education. Very, very smart, I shall say. Who knows? Maybe they do listen to us, Mike. Maybe Chamath is on here every day. Oh, geez. If he's on here, I want to ask him why he said he'd never sell Tesla and then sold Tesla basically a few months later. Looking back when Bank of America came out and called for a crash, I said they would really give you the retail trader a heads up. No way. Hmm. Oh, here we go. Oh, any I didn't. Were you on since uh, Bostic had to do his restatement of his 150? No. <laughs> Can I ask a question, Bob? Sure. A, 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 I'm wondering why he's still a Fed president, and B, if he can't figure out his own disclosure rules, uh, I'm thinking there's I a suspect, problem. I suspect I know why he's still Fed president. Uh, oh. Yeah, I suspect I know why. I shouldn't have asked that question, should I? Well, I'm not going to answer it, but I suspect that I know why he's still a Fed president. Uh, uh, but come on, there's been other Fed presidents that have lost their gig for, for less than this. Come on though. If you can't even get your own disclosures, correct. You're in charge of like trying to manage the economy through rate hikes or cuts. Come on. Sorry. Mm -hmm. This no. You're supposed to, to manage a, a complicated financial situation, but you can't get your filings right. Yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm with you. Uh, I just, I don't get anything anymore. And then the, that, I mean, that just ties in with all the trading that was done before by the retired early group. Shall I call it the Fed retired early group? <laughs> See, those guys didn't actually break any laws or, or violate any regulations and they're gone. They shouldn't oh. have been allowed, but it also, Congress people shouldn't be allowed to, to do it either. Oh, we've had but that whatever. talk in here. I know, whatever. The, the best whatever. traders, the best traders in the world are part of Congress. <laughs> Go figure. Um, Alan, I think you might get your wish. It just might be a different version of it. Okay. What, what were you with Alan? Hold on. Alan Chazen, he's still hoping for a stock think tank resurrection. And you might get your wish. The best thing you could do, Alan, is get a lot more people to join it when you get your wish, if you get your wish. Um, by the way, I want to throw this out before I forget. Thursday, I will not be here. Wednesday, I'm going to try, but I'm going to commit to coming in a couple of mornings or even afternoons to try and make up for it. We had a guest who either had to cancel the podcast or do it Thursday, so I have to do it Thursday. I hear it first. On the, the <laughs> <laughs> I meant to text you, and I'm like, I'll just tell you on this. It's funny. it's okay. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> oh boy, no, it's uh, well. We appreciate whenever you can come on. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, what I have a question. Besides, as it was touched on here. Uh, where was it? I saw something with crude in here. Maybe yeah. I didn't. What, what, oh, Bob, does crude roll down to the next double target area? Remember, we had that weekly double that hit the first target. Do you think it rolls down to the 
Next target before year end on crude or longer? Um, the four year end would, oh, next target? Yes. Yeah, I, I think you mean outside of the target we've already hit. You mean the yes. green line? Uh, I think it potentially could, sure. So here's an interesting thing. I, it, it depends on OPEC now. So first of all, I mean, they made a big deal about this headline about the SPR release. That's The SPR release in November was just pushed to November. It, it's part of the already committed to release. These are still excess releases versus the normal schedule but it's within that 180 million barrels that they announced, what was it, six, eight months ago, something like that. So it's not more barrels. It was pushed to November. I ah, might have something to do with the midterms. I don't know. Um, so they could be political. I don't know. Um, in order to drain the SPR below 210 million barrels, they need an act of Congress. Now they might get it because they still control Congress. So either way, OPEC's 2 million cut, which they're now all over new services showing support from all the other members of OPEC to try and sort of contradict the narrative of President Biden and his administration that says basically that Saudi Arabia pushed the others to do it. Uh, one of the most recent ones I saw, I think, was uh, Nigeria, maybe, but it was put up. Again, if you're interested in crude oil at all and you don't follow Amina Bakar, you should. She's literally one of the first people to tweet OPEC stuff. And I get some of the stuff I talk about, I get from her Twitter. So, um, but she post, she's posted a bunch of different notice, notices from individual members of OPEC who have put out documents and statements that they essentially um, supported the cut. There's also some rumors from some people in the know that OPEC's kind of kicking the tires of doing more, a larger cut. So that's why I say it's it's based on it's based on OPEC. U.S. producers are not going to continue to produce more. Uh, Rystad Energy, who follows a lot of the big producers very closely, put out a report that basically said the large majors, the the big quote unquote big oil, which would be Exxon, BP, Shell, Chevron, essentially all they're doing, all they were doing on the price spike was drilling into existing reserves. They're not replenishing them. So domestic production is not going to help here. All right. So that's something that would be bullish. And you combine that with the, um, the potential for OPEC to do more and maybe we've reached the lows here but i don't believe so because demand is falling at such a rapid pace and that's likely to continue so you're going to have to see some adjustments here and the spr man i'm the spr is such a dangerous thing it's so dangerous what they're doing simply because you're doing it for political reasons. And some people argue, and rightfully so, that any SPR release is political. And, and I agree with that. Of course it is. But this particular one, draining it to levels that we haven't seen, I think we're up to 50 years now. Um, draining it to levels we haven't seen in 50 years, I'm going to look that up while we're talking, is in, it's just nuts because we don't have any hope of any domestic production making that up not in the short to medium term. So you literally have given so much power to OPEC and this no PEC bill would be just a colossal mistake in my, in my opinion, colossal mistake. No PEC would be just the, the complete essential. I'd have to see how the legislation was written, but no PEC has been kicked around for 30, 40 years. And it would literally make it almost illegal to buy from a consortium like this. And if they continue to act publicly as a cartel, um, the U.S. or other people wouldn't be able to buy from them. 405 million barrels now, and that would be through October. Wow, that is, that is low.
So there's a lot more they can do without actually going to the act of Congress. And I suspect it will happen. Uh, question, I'll let you answer it and I'll answer. Uh, George, in hindsight, did we have some form of capitulation, even if it wasn't textbook perfect? I'll let you give your thoughts. I think I, people know my thoughts because I'll wait. Bob? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, in sign, hindsight, do we have some form of capitulation, though, even though it wasn't textbook perfect? Say that one more time. George wants to know if we had any form of capitulation. So, I mean, I'll defer to Mike's capitulative levels, but, or his models, but, okay, here, I'm, I'm going to read you guys something. Hang on a second. I just got to respond to this really quick. Well, let me just jump in here. First off, I go ahead. Capitulations now getting thrown around like pivot was earlier <laughs> by a lot of people who, well, we got capitulation, we got capitulation. We do not, a capitulation is throwing in the towel from a, and getting things flushed out. B, we did not have a flush out move. The move on, I even, I even put in the headline, the move back on Thursday the 13th was not capitulation. It was a reversal rally that was not capitulation. We have not had a, a capitulation is usually a severe snapping move that breaks below key levels that goes down a certain amount of percent. And then it can either be that same day a snap back after a lot of stocks and flushing at, comes out or the next day. We did not hit any of the market internals to do capitulation. Uh, Friday, the pullback was not capitulation. There were just, there has not been anything that has even remotely come close. And we, I, I keep seeing this now with the Capitulation, capitulation, capitulation. We should rally. There was there, there was capitulations like being thrown around like crash was earlier. Willy nilly. There's no regards for anything. So now, Bob. Oh, fantastic! Could somebody take care of those comments? So, I'm, I want to read this to you guys. This is from what is her name? Kelsey Farrow who is a, um, she's at JP Morgan Asset Management, and she is a fixed income portfolio manager. So when we talk about capitulation, I think she put this best as to what um, capitulation, there's, there's various forms of capitulation. Because you gotta be very careful. What Mike's talking about is the capitulation I, that you guys are probably asking about. But when you hear other people talk about capitulation, there's other types. So here's what she said. In answer to a question, are we seeing macro capitulation, investor capitulation, which is what Mike is referring to, or the start of policy capitulation, which would be a pause by the Fed? Here's her response. So where I would push back on that assessment is on policy capitulation. I don't want to comment on the other two. I think when I look at what's been happening in the gilt market, those of course are UK bonds, okay? Which has been really driving global market sentiment. The one thing that I really have taken away is that the BOE has never backed down. They're continuing on with quantitative tightening. We think that's going to happen at the end of the month. And when we look at the big picture, the fundamental data in the US is still suggesting that the Fed needs to continue to push on with rate hikes and quantitative tightening. What the market has been really struggling with is this idea that the Fed is going to pause because of financial stability risks and they're rising. And what I would say to that is there are two things here. There's cost of liquidity and there's access to liquidity. Right now, the cost of liquidity, it's going up. That's monetary policy. That's what the Fed and the other central bankers want. 
access to liquidity. You may not like the level you can raise liquidity at, but you can still raise it. As long as access to liquidity is open, central banks are comfortable with financial stability and they can continue with the path of rate hikes and removing accommodation. Here's the reason I bring that up. Somebody in here, and I don't remember who, it might be options 22, uh, might be Sterling, might be Puddin, I don't remember. Somebody's always asking me about pre- credit risks and credit spreads. They've started to tighten. In other words, the credit risk is starting to leave the market. So you won't or shouldn't expect the Fed to back up. So when people say, like Shashi said, good news is bad news and they're dismissing everything, you could have a positive stock market and have bad GDP and a recession. Mike's pointed that out in his research multiple times. But then the capitulation in the stock market may come after that starts to sort of bleed into GDP. And after the yield curve starts to steepen again. Mike's pointed that out multiple times. I think it's really important to remember the difference between GDP, economic data, and stocks. They're literally three different things. Anyway. So when you hear people talk about capitulation, make sure you know what capitulation they're talking about. Mike's talking about investor capitulation. And I defer to Mike as to whether that's happened or not. That's not what I base my fourth quarter call on. And capitulation, as I will reiterate, is a rarity. It's more frequent than crashes. (laughs) But it's not something that happens all the time, else it wouldn't be capitulation. Right. (laughs) It's literal. It's, you know, remember, people are looking for a reason why, oh, well, we've now had the capitulation bottle. There's capitulation. Let's just buy the market again. There'll always be a reason before, you know, it was. Oh, the, the, the Russia-Ukraine situation was winding down. I don't see it winding down, but, you know, we had that rumors for a while, and that was a reason to buy. There's, there's always something. Just I want to I respond to Shashi's capitulation joke there, and then Coco's asked twice about the U.S. dollar. Yes, we'll get to that, too. So there's Sashi's. Yeah. Shashi, Shashi, there's different, just like there's different kinds of recessions, there's an earnings recession, there's an economic recession, um, there's different kinds of capitulation, but when we talk about it, when most people ask about it, they mean investor capitulation. Uh, oh boy, and if you don't like the definition, just change it. Just change uh, it. So... Capitulation still means the same thing, there's just different kinds of it. Although, no, to some people, it's it's becoming, it was, uh. any thoughts on the U.S. dollar, Bob? Yes. If um, Kelsey Farrow is right, you're still going to see the U.S. dollar medium term outperform. Okay. It almost has to because the U.S. economy is the best house on a dilapidated block that's falling apart. So the the Federal Reserve is likely to remain the most aggressive of the central banks. And if Kelsey, again, is right that the Bank of England didn't back down, certainly the U.S. Fed's not going to back down. So we might get a little bit of relief here because it was a period of time where the Fed was the only game in town. I shouldn't say that. Australia was tightening. Canada was tightening. But the U.K. was pausing and the EU wasn't doing anything. So you might get a little bit of a pullback there, but, you know, medium to long term, the dollar kind of has to stay the core. But, you know, learn, look at price action when you're looking at this. Gary loses every time he shorts the U.S. dollar. Well, there's (laughs) stop shorting the U.S. dollar. (laughs) Oh, the U.S. dollar, if you've been shorting the U.S. dollar, you have to be pretty much timed very well because the overall it's been on a bull tear for uh a very long time yeah by the way bob side note we've had some more uh yen intervention it it's getting very short lived <laughs> each little intervention is i mean it doesn't even last 
Uh, it didn't last an hour. <laughs> they're just, they're, they're, I, Japan, the, the Bank of Japan has not capitulated. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> See, there's currency capitulation, Shashi, by central banks. There's just there's a lot of different kinds of capitulations. Yeah, I mean, I it's almost getting their their interventions are painfully ineffective. Uh, yeah, sh and pa yeah, sh painfully ineffective and painfully short lived. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they can't be happy. Uh, look at this. This is a 15 minute bar. <laughs> And it's done. And it's gone. <laughs> I mean, th that's got to hurt. Ugh. So, I mean, when, when I don't know when they throw in the towel. Yeah. The, I don't either. But Bob called it spot on. A Jackson Hole would drop the market. So... I would like to know what's the next big volatility event he expects. That's a question for Amadeus. I would suspect at this point, but don't quote me on this because it can change. Um, not the next PCE report, but the one after that. Because the next one is likely to show, and by the way, we'll have the midterms before the next one, I believe, for the next PCE report. Uh, I could be wrong about that. Uh, midterm elections will probably be a bullish event. That's also part of the reason that I thought the fourth quarter would finish positively. But it also, it could be the opposite. So I'm going to go with the next PCE, but uh, ask Amadeus, keep coming back and asking me because it could change. All right. Anything I, we just have, besides earnings, we have a very light week in economic releases. Yeah. Earnings is the key right now. And earnings is likely to be a stabilizing factor for now. So, I mean, tomorrow is just building permits and then we, oh, yay, Fed speak. But that's not till after the close. Yeah. And so that's, I didn't review that earlier. Pretty, uh, not much, not much overall selling after the uh, bounce back today. Still, you know what? The 75 basis points slowly edging back, but still at 93.4. You know, I got I got a jump, but can you put up Sterling's comment? She He's just putting up what Lizanne Saunders said. Sure. There you go. So there's something about this, and, and I – Liz Ann's one of the best out there, in my opinion, but I'm not sure what she was trying to say here. Um, less than 1% of Americans by wealth own 53.1% of all stocks in the U.S. Top 10% own almost 89% and bottom 50 own less than 1%. The misleading thing in there is to assume that the bottom 50 don't have a sizable amount of their wealth in stocks. Now, I don't know that number, but I know that more than 60% of Americans own stocks. The fact that somebody like Carl Icahn might own such a large amount of stocks that it skews those numbers. And obviously there's more people than just Carl Icahn. You look at somebody like Elon Musk, who still owns a majority of Tesla, Mark Zuckerberg, who still owns a majority of Facebook. That's what makes those numbers skew in that direction. But let somebody like, I mean, I could use a relative. I'll leave out what relative it is. Okay. He has a sizable, I know this for a fact, he has a sizable amount of his net worth in stocks, but it's only about $300,000 worth of stocks. And that's not going to move the needle on anything Lizanne just said there. But it will move the needle on his behavior if stocks continue to fall. So it's very misleading, that particular statement. And, and again, I'm not sure what Lizanne is trying to say there. Um, you're not going to affect Elon Musk or Carl Icahn or Mark Zuckerberg with a big crash in stocks. It might affect who they hire. It might affect how many people they bring into their companies, their headcounts. But... It, it's just not a very good metric, in my opinion, 
of how the U.S. public is going to act. A lot of people own stocks, okay? Plumbers, firemen, police officers, because it's in their 401ks and in their pension funds, and they just don't report it as ownership. And it's also a big portion of what they're going to retire on. So anyway, I don't have those numbers, though, so I might be completely nuts. All right. Then we won't see you Thursday. So you won't see me Thursday, but I, I'm not sure what appearances I can make. Uh, I can make tomorrow morning, I believe, but uh, Mike, I'll just have to keep in touch with you. Just put my face on all of the things. Put your face on all the things, and then if you show up, well, that would be I false advertising. I, we past performance is not indicative of whether <laughs> I'll show up or not. So if you're not here on Thursday, I'll only like have two viewers then. Oh, well. well. <laughs> Did you see we're past 6,000 subscribers? Nice. I, tomorrow yeah. I've got scheduled a Futures Edge podcast short with Shy Girl on Twitter. And she's going to be talking about the SPR. So I think that's going to be kind of a really fun thing to watch. 60 seconds long. Perfect. Her talking about the SPR. I think that's interesting. All right. With that, I will let you go, Bob. Thank you. I am tired, Coco. I'm tired of your attitude. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, by the way, Bob, quick wait. We have one other question from way earlier. Yeah. How many tattoos do you have? I guess it matters if you count these as individual tattoos, it would make the numbers a lot different. These are all related, but they're four different tattoos. So that would make it one, two, three, four, eight. That would make it eight. But this is really kind of one themed arm, but it's eight. Diff it's four different tattoos, so it'd be a total of eight. Well, there you go. For anybody who needed to know, and I have zero. Yeah, I like, no, I'm tired of Coco's attitude. All right. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I love you, Coco. I'll see you guys later. See ya. All right. Let me check. Uh, Bob's mafia name is now Bobby Eight Tats. Well, you'll have to run that by Bob. Let me see. Why is this one washed out? I got to fix. I'm trying something while I'm between computers. Oh, uh, let me try to fix this real quick. Hold on. There we go. Let's see how this is. One second. One second. Oh, boy. Well, there I look a little. You like pink mic or green mic? Let me fix this a little better. All right. Playing with uh, some multiple camera stuff just while I'm on the old system again. Uh, so, I actually love today. By the way, real quick for the people attempting to learn. To, I got cut off this morning. Not I was not trying to drop. Suddenly this morning for everybody, I said I was going, but then it was a very abrupt end. That was not me ending the live stream. I actually had more to say. Uh, that was the the power company here, ComEd, was, uh, there's raised power lines across the street from me. They were trimming the trees before winter all up and down the street. Now below the power lines... There is the Comcast cable lines. So, in the process of trimming the limbs around the power lines, guess what happened? And then, yes, I have backup internet, but by the time it switches over, the live stream goes kaput. Finito. So, if anybody was wondering why I disappeared so abruptly, and that is why. 
Sorry about that. Normally I do slightly more graceful sign-off, but I cannot control. That's also why I do have backup internet. Because it really stinks to try to trade from a cell phone <laughs> when you can trade from a computer. Now, a cell phone is, is back up, and I guess I can, uh, I can turn my cell phone into a hotspot. Uh, still, I'd rather have a full backup internet for everything I need to do to run multiple computers. That will fail over, so that's why I have that. All right, one quick thing I wanted to point out with the shift in the tick. So we opened strong. You see here, this was the zero area. See, pulling back a couple times then, what do you see? Shift. What do you see here? Lower high, lower high, lower high. Lower low, lower low, lower low. Then we start getting getting momentum, pretty significant momentum bars. And look at the tagging of the minus 1,000 to 1,200. So for the, this is a distinct, when I talk about watching for a pullback and a shift in the tick, this was a clear distinction. Then what happened? It started to rebound back up. We got the one final flush out this afternoon. Then the little stronger tick coming back. If you weren't watching that, this momentum bars, this momentum bars do not stand in the way of momentum bars if you're trying to buy. You go with momentum bars if you're selling. So, just wanted to point that out. Also, why did I love today? I love these secondary reactions. Why? Because now I have a firm stop level. What did this do? This is where you don't need a lot of fancy stuff. This is where we can take, we can take stuff off the chart. Let's just get back to charting basics. Rally. Okay. Correction. What does this form? Key resistance. What was broken? Key resistance. What should this turn into? Key support. How do we know? We have it tested. Test. Test. You see this? Really nice test. Where do you think? For this most recent run-up, where do you think I would be focusing on stops? Just from pure price action, not throwing anything else into the mix. It's very handy to learn pure price action. Period. Yes, there's other things I look at to help fine-tune. But if you gave me a chart and said I could not have anything else on it, could it be traded? Yes. And that's one of the key concepts. Also, what is this? I sometimes think people need to get back to some basics a little more than focusing on everything else. And I, I put up other stuff for a reason because I, I trade with it. However... You just have a chart. Again, if you got to go back to the basics. This is a clear path. So now we have key resistance becoming support. You start getting a move down here, especially below this support and support breaks, especially on a short term break and retest and rollover. Now all these people who've bought in here are what? Wrong. Not only... I can't say wrong because there might be myriad of reasons that the, the, their trade is now losing money if this was their only trade. And anybody who's watching this from pure support resistance, what happens if it drops back down here? Now the resistance becoming support is now broken into a clear path move. Do you think from a shorter term positioning up here that I personally I personally would not want to hold uh, key longs going back into a clear path move 
with this kind of volatility once key support is broken and it was finally validated as support with today's price action. Then I can bring in other tools. And what's another tool you think, I'll, what do you think I'll look at? I just, I think it's helpful. And if, if you know, if this is boring, then I don't, I understand if you want to tune out or join us at another time for a live stream. So let's just bring in the concept of rotation zone. I have now the rotation zone, which should actually reconnect with price action, even if it hangs out up here, even if it pulls back a bit. This four hour rotation zone is my first, remember the primary rotation zones besides intraday where I watch the five and 15. The major ones are daily four and four hour besides weekly, but we don't need to check on that every day. What would this be if we started breaking below this, we'd also be back below the four hour. So far, we got a couple dips in the four hour and it rotated back up. If we start breaking down below here, especially with this four hour rotation zone getting out of the way, I don't want to be short term long. And then on top of that, I can bring in all my other tools to help fine tune it. So, there's a little quick, a little quick lesson of how you can just use pure price action to sit there. Now, let's look at the shorter term chart. This was not a double bottom. Why was this not a double bottom? That does not mean above here is not tradable. Why wasn't it a double bottom? because the second and third targets are clearly beyond the move that started it. Does that mean it's not tradable? No. This is a rotation back up from the four hour rotation zone. What does that mean? Well, we have a clear path move here. It's actually an advanced clear path move on the 15 minute. So trading in this, if you're using a shorter term uh, time frame, you get a key close here into what we call an advanced clear path move. We have a minor pausing area though, but the breakdown area is here. Great first target. And then the end of the clear path move is another target. So I don't need the double targets. I have different targets. Does not mean that this move is not tradable into this clear path. And so I had to go down in a time frame to get the targets. But here was that 15 minute breakdown target just overhead 3763.75, which is nearly hit, which will probably be hit once the futures reopen. And then the end of the clear path move 3773.50. Does that mean I have to completely exit a position here? No. Why not? Because as I talked about before, when we closed above the 62 and a half, which we did today on the daily, but before this, we closed above the 62 and a half, and I've reversed them temporarily from this move down. But here's the 62 and a half here that we were talking about, the 3700s, which we closed on the four hour and retested today. What should we still favor? A return to the 87 and a half to 100% range. The bare minimum is 30. 780.25. So that would be my next target. The next target above there is still the harmonic area, which I use can be used to raise stops. 37.91.75. And then now a major target area because it's between the 87 and 100 is the 200 and this other key level. 3801 just happens to be right around 3800. So that is a major target. So not only do I have stop raise targets, A, depending on time frame, they could be also used for partial profits. They could be used for a number of things, but I've identified my key levels moving up. I've also identified a key stop level. 
especially once this four hour rotation zone edges up a bit, which will happen overnight. Why? Because if you look at here, back into a clear path move. I don't want to be holding uh, shorter term longs if we get key closes back below this level into a clear path move. With daily cycles starting to flatten out, does that mean I go bearish? No, I don't have a fantastic topping pattern yet. I have some waning potential momentum, but nothing major, nothing major. Also, let's look at the other markets. NASDAQ, here was the trigger on this 15 minute double bottom and virtually first target is hit. Here was the trigger and then ran right there and we closed out the day. This was valid because the first and second target went into the candle bodies. The third target is within the wick. So now I have targets the upside and we have the prior return at 75 harmonic level and the target for the doubles. Any pullback now is a return to the trigger area on the double. Stop levels, we have prior resistance. By the way, the gaps were filled in the, both the futures. We did have legitimate gaps, which were also filled today, which is something I forgot to mention on the S&P. But now I have stop levels also. Separate from the double, I have stop levels for any other longer trades anywhere off these key lows. Right here. Into a clear path move. So I've identified that. Hope this is making sense. Now, why I'm pointing out these levels because different people can use them depending on what their time frame is. Uh, Dow, by the way, did trigger. This is a valid double bottom. We got the reaction from the 50, but this is triggered. So even on a pullback, this double would not, even on a small pullback, this double would not be invalidated. So we have that trigger on the Dow only. But the Dow, if you're trading the probabilities from the doubles, 31,242, 31,607, 31,971 are the targets higher. The stop level, because it's always good to know the stop level, the stop level from where this was triggered on a closing basis, and this would be on a daily closing basis, would be below 29.339. On a trade through basis, 29.105. So I know, and I, this is a more aggressive stop raise until we get some more stability in these markets. Russell confirmed a double, but did not trigger it. So this doubles confirmed, but not triggered in the Russell. So we have conf some conflicting things here, which is the whole nature of this market. But this was not triggered, which is why, especially in these markets, why we wait for the trigger. Just some little tea. By the way, as I talked about with the dollar index today, we also broke down a little this morning said to watch that also where we broke down a little snap back then broke down but we do this is nearly turning into a triple in case the dollar comes back strong this evening uh 112 20 if this pulls back to these lows it would be a triple on both the one hour and the four hour would be invalidated too so it's off the table then VIX, just to recap a couple things, then I'm going to call it a day. We had the potential double with the volatility, then it just blew through first, second targets, and then we reversed. This is actually sort of a bullish move into the close. 
rotation zone. We start trading below now this tomorrow into this. I'm going to be targeting a VIX retest of this 2850 level. Then guess what? If we get the daily close below 2850, I got to favor a continued rally from a VIX perspective, which means the VIX will continue to drop. So, notes, test in both ends, but no breakout or breakdown. Still, that's rotation zone. Any moves into this ADMA getting sold so far, but the, this 110, 18, 110, 17 is getting bought. We're consolidating. We should see, uh, not necessarily tomorrow, but uh, at some point, a sharper move now from compared to the Thursday's wider range bar. We have one, two, three inside days compared to last Thursday. Volatility contraction in the notes. The longer this goes on, generally the more severe move, either up or down, on the breakout or breakdown. So, that's where we sit. What timetable do you usually look at for which? That's a very open-ended question. From longer term, I focus on from swing trading and longer. Well, anything longer than swing trading are daily and weeklies. From swing trading, it's four-hour daily and weekly. And then for micro trading, it's, uh, I, I mean, it could be, it's one hour, 15 and five minute, five minute is only on extreme momentum. Cause you know, I also switch the 15 minute as we get closer to lunchtime and the European close, if I'm on the five minute, I think more people even even with micro, even if you're trading on shorter term time frames, learn to use key analysis off your daily charts and your four hour charts. You can execute it on much smaller time frames. Too many people get caught up in the micro time frames and don't zoom out. Tesla is an interesting place going in earnings tomorrow. Not a lot of stopping points below or above its current position on the one hour, four hour, and daily charts. And Tesla confirmed the double, but complete gap fill. I mean, Tesla was just uh, selling off the bat today. Selling off the bat. Gap up and just relentless selling for the gap fill. So it confirmed a double, but not triggered. And it needed a trigger on a four hour, a bare minimum one hour. It's an earnings play tomorrow. And then, you know, you still got the Twitter stuff. So it's still a story stock even after earnings. I mean, I think a pop ups another gift to people wanting to short this. But other than that, you uh, it's it's now a volatility play going into earnings, and you, it's so funny because even a lot of consensus from bulls in Tesla, you know, the diehard bulls are like, "It's good earnings are going to be great." Elon has to have great earnings for for the Twitter deal. So what are you saying? He has to manufacture great earnings for the Twitter deal? It's the, Tesla's just insane. Uh, so you don't have a trigger double, which is actually what I was watching for, for a at least a technical bias going into earnings, but there's nothing yet. Uh, Amazon looks like a nice breakout. Do you see a stop? Then I'm going to wrap this up. I am actually very tired too. Oops. 
these markets. Amazon. This is where it helps folks. Uh, essentially, Amazon, even on a pullback to here for a gap fill, nowhere near to stop from this triggered uh, double. Why did I go through the time frames you see here? You got to double check. It's a, still a well formed double on the one hour and the one hour, uh, second and First targets go into the candle bodies. That's why I wanted to verify again with the four hour was right here, cutting really close. The one hour does confirm it. So for stop levels, I would just be utilizing the stop. Aggressive stop levels would be slightly below about 112.50. Conservative stop levels, I would use the double or below 108.95 on a closing basis. However, if you start breaking down below this 50, watch out. Short term, uh, would anything, even for this gap pullback, since it did technically trigger a double, and you do need an up close, this was the up close that triggered it, by the way. And by the way, uh, I'd also use your stop reduction. So let me rephrase that because I hit the first stop level. The stop level I'd be utilizing now is 110.66 on a closing basis. On a one hour closing basis. But those targets, the upside 121.24 and then 123.31 are still playable on market strength. All right. Did I miss a comment here? I must have. Did I miss something or I saw restate something, but oh well. Uh, so that's where we sit right now. I am going to wrap it up today. You're welcome, Gary Sterling. Thank you for being here. Uh, yep, thank you for everyone who comes on the live stream and supports the channel every day. I will wrap it up for now. See everyone tomorrow morning. Remember, not much going into the open. Also, let's take a look at earnings. Uh, I got to dive more into this Netflix stuff. I'm going to do that after I take a break and walk the dogs. And I'm really going to do a deeper dive into Netflix. I'm really curious about that because that there are some things that just I know we have the Stranger Things aspect of Netflix, but some of their subscriber numbers seemed a little a little interesting tomorrow before the open. What am I looking for? P and G to see what they can pass along inflation-wise to consumer. Uh, that's not a bunch. I'll glance at Abbott. Remember, after the close tomorrow is Tesla. Uh, we'll take a look at Alcoa, IBM. Ugh. And that's about it. But then going into the rest of the week, go oh, by UAE. I saw this United Airlines did beat and had a very decent gap up after market and still holding this is another one for a short-term play uh would be to target the 200 for from my perspective and then eventually a rollover and back gap fill so short term upside longer term we'll be watching for a gap fill play what time does this come on youtube uh it starts at 3 30 central time for the countdown 4 30 eastern time in the morning we come on with the countdown starting at 8 central 9 eastern and sterling sterling remember 
everything central to everything revolves off of where I am located, which is central time. <laughs> Just kidding. So anybody looking at airline plays, if you're it's I would not ignore this, even if you're already in it, I would not ignore this 200 as a key area. With that, I will wrap it up for New Jersey time would be Eastern time. So that would be 9 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Are the normally scheduled ones, sometimes I come on at lunch. And then on Sundays, it is 4 Eastern time. Thank you for being here, Kathy. I used to live in New Jersey, too. In Mount Laurel, New Jersey. So there you go. I've lived a lot of places. All right. With that, I shall wrap it up for now. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Talk to everyone tomorrow. See ya.